Hamas unveiled a new rocket capable of striking Tel Aviv, and U.S. forces were attacked 11 times in Iraq and Syria over the past few days. What's going on, everyone? Let's take a look at some updates as it relates to the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas. I'm recording this at 8 a.m. Central on Saturday, December 9th, 2023. Overnight, Israel released the names and pictures of three of their soldiers that they say fell in the line of duty during combat operations in and around Gaza. The Gaza Health Ministry through Al Jazeera updated their casualty information, saying that since October 7th, 17,487 Palestinians have been killed and at least 46,480 wounded. Now, a couple notes with the Gaza Health Ministry information here. Uh, this graphic that I used from Al Jazeera does not update the Israeli casualty information. I don't know why, but they don't. Uh, I, I wish they would. I wish there'd be one single source that would consistently update information for the two sides. I feel like that would lend it more credibility. Uh, that's not the case here. The Gaza Health Ministry operating in Gaza now and previously means that at the very least, the organization is overseen by Hamas. Uh, and, and finally... The Hamas militants that have been killed by Israel, and the, the highest number I've seen has been 5,000 since October 7th. That is included in these numbers, or believed to be included in these numbers by the Gaza Health Ministry, but it's not called out separately. Now, in Gaza yesterday, Israel announced that two IDF soldiers were seriously injured during an operation where they tried to rescue at least one of their soldiers being held hostage by Hamas. Israel said that during the operation, numerous terrorists who took part in the abducting and the holding of these hostages were killed. However, no hostages were rescued in this operation. Hamas put out a statement about this yesterday saying that they recognized this operation took place. Uh, Hamas said that they thwarted it, that they, they brought the Israeli soldiers under fire, uh, were able to kill or wound a number of Israeli soldiers, and that the captured soldier that Israel was trying to recover was subsequently killed in that operation. Now, Hamas released a pretty graphic video. The first part showed the soldier speaking while in captivity, uh, and the second part showed that the soldier had clearly passed. Uh, now, I have seen competing claims, nothing from official sources at this point, competing claims from Hamas that the soldier died as a result of the Israeli operation, be it airstrikes or direct fire engagements from Israeli forces on the ground. Uh, whereas some sources inside of Israel are saying that Hamas tortured and executed this prisoner and are blaming it on Israel. Then as fighting continues both in the north around Gaza City and to the south around Khan Yunus, Israel says that over the last 48 hours, they have apprehended and taken into custody more than 200 suspected Hamas fighters. They said that in the neighborhood of Shajaya, uh, fighters from the battle team of the Kafir Brigade eliminated a terrorist squad and found AK-47s and grenades stored in a school. They also said they uncovered multiple tunnel shafts, one of which had an elevator installed. They added that fighters from the Kafir Brigade encountered a squad of terrorists in the area of a school in the Shajaya neighborhood. Uh, there was an engagement there in which a number of the Hamas terrorists were killed. And in a subsequent search of that area, Israeli soldiers found more AK-47s, grenades, and ammunition, again stored inside some of the classrooms. There was some additional footage coming out as well, showing that these weapons were not just uncovered inside of schools, uh, but also being stored inside of United Nations bags. Additionally, Israel said that forces from the Golani Brigade's combat team identified a number of terrorists armed with anti-tank missiles that were identified and subsequently eliminated. Anti-tank missiles is probably referring to the tandem charge RPGs that we see in so many of the Hamas videos they put out, and I'll show some of those here in just a moment. Uh, so just from the Israeli side alone, we've seen a significant uptick in the operational tempo over the course of the last three to four days, uh, and the same goes from what we're hearing from Hamas right now. Then shifting over to the Hamas side, they claim responsibility for more than 20 attacks against Israeli forces in the past 24 hours, adding that they completely or partially destroyed another 21 Israeli vehicles. Now, I showed yesterday some footage of, of for the first time, I think, since this war kicked off, uh, proof that at least some Israeli vehicles have been destroyed, which is understandable. The fighting is intense and at close range uh, and is raging 24-7, so of course some of these vehicles are going to be destroyed and damaged. I uh, did randomly come across a video of an Israeli tank being towed off the battlefield. This was shared, of all places, on a Russian Telegram channel. 
Uh, so hard to tell from this footage the, the extent of the damage to the tank, but most of these vehicles, unless they're just completely burned out holes, are going to be able to uh, go through some repairs and get right back into the fight in usually a relatively short period of time. Then we got another video put out by Hamas here showing relatively close range attacks against Israeli forces all across Gaza. And, and this one includes a short clip of Hamas militants exiting one of the tunnels in Gaza, coming out and firing these RPGs against Israeli military targets. Now, it's no Houthi music video shot on top of a stolen commercial vessel, but Hamas put out a relatively professionally done video yesterday uh, showing off their new M90 rocket. Now, you got to think that this was shot before the October 7th attacks. Just hard to imagine that there's space for this anywhere in Gaza right now with just the amount of overhead ISR and aircraft that Israel has in that area right now. So the M90 supposedly has a range up to 90 kilometers and is built in-house, built in Gaza. So 90 kilometers doesn't quite range all of Israel, but it does put Tel Aviv in their sights, which is you know obviously a major population center. So this also comes with what you're seeing right there, the uh, what's being called the LM90 multiple launch rocket pod, which can fire up to eight of these rockets at any given point. Now, in terms of accuracy, uh, it depends. When you're talking about unguided rockets, especially those that are built you know, in-house like this, generally we would refer to these as area targets rather than point targets, which means that you're targeting maybe a few city blocks rather than one specific building. Now, it's notable that the rockets were not launched in that video, right? Hamas puts out videos all the time of rocket launches into Israeli territory, but for this one, they didn't. And that wasn't really the purpose of what they were doing here. They were just trying to show the existence of this M90 rocket. My understanding is that these have been used somewhat since the war kicked off. Uh, but you know, if you're looking back as to when this was filmed before October 7th, in all likelihood, if Hamas expected this war to kick off, it's not crazy that they would say, let's get some shots of these things actually uh, out there being loaded like we would be shooting them, but don't waste any munitions before this war actually starts. 84 times since October 17th. That's how many times American forces in Iraq and Syria have been attacked in just two months. And I feel like a lot of these aren't being reported. They're not necessarily being hidden, just not making the news, if that's a difference worth noting. Uh, so yesterday, news came out across a handful of Shiite militia telegram channels claiming upwards of 11 attacks in Iraq and Syria against U.S. forces. This included attacks at Erbil, Al-Assad Air Base, Conoco Gas Field in Syria, and the American Embassy in Baghdad. There was some footage from that one confirming that it did happen. And, and the U.S. kind of spoke to this, right? We didn't go into the details about where each attack took place. Uh, but in a call with Iraq's Prime Minister, U.S. Secretary of Defense Austin singled out two specific groups as being responsible. He called out Kataib Hezbollah and Hakarat Hezbollah al-Nujaba, saying that the United States reserves the right to respond decisively against these organizations. And we have responded against those organizations in the past, but as of late, there have not been a lot of retaliatory strikes carried out by the U.S. against these groups in Iraq and Syria or even the Houthis down in Yemen. Now, a little background, a uh, high-level view on these couple groups here. Kataib Hezbollah, or the Hezbollah Brigade, has been fighting in Iraq and Syria since at least 2007, so they've been around for a little while. They've accumulated a fair amount of pretty significant weaponry, not just from the theaters in Iraq and Syria. You know, there's been a lot of weapons left around there, but also from their primary backer, Iran. Then Hakarat Hezbollah al Jaba, or the Movement of the Party of God's Noble Ones, is also an Iranian-backed Shiite militia. Uh, they also have the same with Kataib Hezbollah, pretty significant ties to Lebanese Hezbollah. Then in, in terms of the size of these two organizations, it's kind of hard to dial in. Um, I've seen estimates from as low as 3,000 per organization to as many as 10,000 plus. Uh, it's just hard. These, these are loosely formed militias operating across a couple different countries. Hard to dial in that overall in strength. Then over at the United Nations, the United States vetoed a proposed Security Council resolution calling for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. In terms of that draft resolution, 13 members voted in favor, the U.S. vetoed, and the U.K. abstained. So the Deputy U.S. Ambassador Robert Wood said that the United States vetoed that resolution because, quote, it was divorced from reality that would not move the needle forward on the ground in any concrete way. We do not support this resolution's call for an unsustainable ceasefire that will only plant the seeds for the next war, end quote. 
Uh, Britain's UN ambassador, Barbara Woodward, said that they abstained because there's no condemnation of Hamas included in the resolution, saying, quote, Israel needs to be able to address the threat posed by Hamas, and it needs to do so in a manner that abides by international humanitarian law so that such an attack can never be carried out again, end quote. Of course, Hamas had something to say on this as well. They put out a statement overnight saying, quote, We strongly condemn the Biden administration's veto that hindered a resolution at the UN Security Council demanding an immediate halt to the aggression on Gaza. We consider the U.S. administration to be an accomplice in the killing of our people through its, pol through its political and military support for the occupation to continue its genocidal war on the Gaza Strip, end quote. Now, while this was a new vote for a new resolution, these stances haven't really changed, like, at all. Um, if anything, there's been a little more movement by the U.S. and the U.K. and a couple others towards at least hearing out the ideas for ceasefires or for humanitarian pauses, whatever we're going to call it. Uh, but the, the U.S. stance that a ceasefire benefits Hamas in the short term, that's been pretty consistent. So it's a new vote, but the policies here, the stances haven't really changed since October 7th. But that's all I got for now. Of course, if interested in national security subjects, be sure to check out the sit reps I put out on Substack. Link is in the description below. Substack now also has ad-free, sponsor-free videos that go live about one hour before they're up on YouTube. But thanks for watching. I'll see y'all next time.